Okay, I think I can go ahead. Morning, everyone. My name Morning. is Louisa Colville. I am Deputy Secretary General at the Kansas CDC, and I'm very honored to be here today. Firstly, I would like to thank the NYU for opening its doors once again for the Brazilian Arbitration Day. Not only the present event, but all the other initiatives organized by the university, which are so beneficial for advertising best arbitration practices. Uh, secondly, a big thank you to all panelists for their invaluable contribution. We would not be here today if it wasn't for your dedication and your constant efforts to contribute to the arbitral community. It is indeed an honor to be here, well, I would say standing, but not really just, you know, sitting here amongst all of you. Um, we're also very grateful for our phenomenal institutional supporters. So thank you to Arbitral Women and to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, both Brazilian and New York branch. These organizations have, uh, are very much in line with CAMSA CBC's purposes to expand and improve ADR best practices. Last but not least, thank you to the audience, so to students, to lawyers, arbitrators who are watching us. I hope you can enjoy this event and take in as much as possible of the knowledge which will be shared. Uh, most importantly, we want you to participate as well and to keep sending us your questions, your concerns, anything here on the chat function, and we will try to incorporate those uh, with the speakers during this event. Mm, I'll use this brief time we have together to say just a few words about this particularly odd period we're living in. The fact that the pandemic created lots of obstacles for us uh, is no longer news to share. Uh, but I do like, I would like to share that we learned a lot from these adversities. Gladly, in a short period of time, the arbitral community has adapted and evolved to respond to the challenges and to the new demands. The institutions have learned to conduct their proceedings on a virtual format, preventing technical issues and confidentiality breaches. We efficiently migrated from physical cases to the complete virtual conduction of the proceedings. Take Kansas CBC, for example. Contrary to what would be expected, after the outbreak of the pandemic, the number of proceedings initiated at the Kansas CBC between 2019 and 2020 had an increase of almost 10%. And this year, Kansas CBC received almost 90 arbitration, 90 arbitration proceedings, uh, while at the same time last year, we only had around 64 arbitration proceedings. So that is an increase of nearly 30%. So the institutions, uh, they, not only they had to adapt, but they also had to do so while the number of arbitration, of arbitration cases continued to increase, which was particularly challenging. When the pandemic hit Brazil, in March 2020, the Secretariat was efficient in virtualizing all cases, moving them to our case management platform in less than 48 hours. Along with the conductions of the hearings virtually, institutions had to improve their cybersecurity measures. Uh, at Kemsa CBC, we have adopted a new cybersecurity protocol with several layers of protection, which go from hardware to software and technical training of our staff our staff, which has proven to be a very effective measure. All of this to ensure the integrity of the virtual hearings and the protection of the very sensible information which is shared during an arbitration proceeding. The virtualization of the proceedings also diminished the use of premium materials contributing to greener arbitration conduction. And this is very important for us uh, the impact on our cases was substantial. Without the need to send the, and receive hard copies, electronic filing made the process much faster and cheaper. From March 2020 to December 2020, a total of over 15,000 letters were not sending hard copies. And that means a decrease in 97% in comparison to 2019. This alone amounted to over half a million Brazilian reais saved in courier costs and an immeasurable benefit to the environment. One of our studies regarding arbitration proceeding costs during the pandemic revealed a decrease of 93% of uh, costs in the arbitration proceedings. That means just the hearings, the hard copies, coffee breaks, etc. all of those which moved now to the virtual world. All these changes 
demanded the law from the arbitrators as well to adapt to the new form of conduction of hearings to the virtual format. The arbitrators now have to keep track of the time difference between the parties, uh, the witnesses, the experts. They, they need to bear in mind their internet con connectivity, the available equipment, the virtual platform used, document management and sharing, and witness cross-examination matters, such as sequestration or risk of tampering, among others. Councils also had to deal with the new challenges which were created by the pandemic, like the, the, such as the different approaches regarding examination and cross-examination of witnesses and constant effort to capture the tribunal's attention in a setup that naturally diminishes the attention span of the involved parties. Today, we will be discussing the best, um, well, we will be discussing practical aspects of arbitration, including best oral skills on evidentiary hearings, uh, a particular focus on the opening arguments. So these are all crucial aspects for the arbitration practitioners, which wanna thrive in this new arbitration world. And we're also going to hear war stories from great practitioners who have seen basically everything. They have seen it all from snoozy participants to cat lawyers on Zoom. And so they will be sharing that with us today. Arbitration has been around for a very long time, but it is still able to surprise us. And that's what makes it so fascinating. It is undeniable that also the institutions did a great job so far in dealing with this new scenario created by the pandemic. And we can expect the conduction of the proceedings to be increasingly polished until we can provide the best possible experience for the arbitral community. Uh, without further ado, I wish you all an outstanding SEP webinar, and I hope that you can extract the most out of it. And thank you so much for the incredible panelists here present. Now, because I am on a bit of a double heading situation here, uh, I would like to move on and welcome our first panel, which will be regarding persuasion, strategies for effective hearing skills from councils and tribunals perspectives. And on that, we have uh, Eric Levin, Frederico Singaraja, Greta Walters, and Pedro Martinez Fraga. I'll, keep, I'll skip reading their CV, just go straight to the interesting part, but trust me that they are all high level professionals and also amazing people. <laughs> so welcome first panel. And as your modest moderator, I would like to begin by asking Erica, to maybe start with us uh, sharing on what do you think is the most effective way of structuring your opening for an arbitration? Thank you, Louisa, and thank you, CAMC, CDC, and NYU. I wish we were all together in person. I know that it's been a while and we're adjusting to the new norm or the current norm or the continued, but at least we get to see each other's faces. And to the students at NYU, you know, this is a really special program and I'm sorry that we can't be there with you, but feel free to reach out to us if there's anything you need and we can support you. In terms of structuring your opening, you know, uh, we'll, we'll hear from my co-panelists as well. I think the key really is, you know, be concise, be human, be interesting, build credibility, build rapport. Those are things that are changing in terms of virtual aspects and they're a little bit difficult and different. We'll discuss that later on. But really the key for me is know your audience, know your purpose. You always wanna have an organized presentation, understand what you're doing, what your, what your focus is in terms of the important points. Um, but I also, and I don't know if this is always done, I always like to have a theme, some sort of an aspect that keeps things interesting and framed in a way that's positive and memorable. All the while, it's not always easy interjecting the key points that you need, because again, Remember why you're there and remember the distinction between the oral and the written. Your tribunal has the pleadings. This is your moment to connect. This is your moment to really demonstrate your, your client's position. And all the while, think about what the end purpose is. You want that award to be written in your client's best interest, right? So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that because I'm sure that my co-panelists want to interject and we can go, you know, we can all talk together. But that that's pretty much the the, the opening um, that I would say in terms of just thinking through. Um, so without further ado, I, I invite my co-panelists to, to also give some comments. Maybe if we could hear Frederico on that. 
thank you, Louisa. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, good afternoon from London. Um, I'd like to thank NYU and County CBC as well. And especially I'd like to thank them for doing this at what is actually quite a civilized hour for us here in London. Normally these events are in Brazilian New York evening, which means it's the middle of the night for me. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, I completely agree with uh, Erica's thoughts. Um, coming from a, a common law jurisdiction, um, in arbitrations here in London that are often seated in London where you may have US or English uh, arbitrators, um, the, the, what is termed as an opening might vary and it's normally reduced quite a lot. So it wouldn't be uncommon not to be, not to, not to have any kind of real opening at all as, as what might be recognized traditionally as an opening, apart from you know, a couple of minutes each to just state the obvious. Um, and also a lot of time is taken up with housekeeping issues or last minute applications, which I'm sure everyone is accustomed to dealing at the beginning of a, of a long hearing uh, in an arbitration. But that aside, if you do have time, then um, one of the strategies I employ quite a lot is, as Erica said, you want to win the trust and confidence of the tribunal. That's your real first opportunity to do that. And so I quite like enjoy both when I'm sitting as an arbitrator and when I'm counsel to advance three main things. One is a neutral and objective chronology of the relevant facts um, so that the, the tribunal may know. There are varying degrees as to the extent to which a tribunal may have read into the papers and that may or may not be helpful. Number two is to take the tribunal to the relevant parts of the contract which might be in dispute. And number three is to set out the issues and disputes which are being referred for them to decide and maybe set them out as factual or legal. Um, I do not argue my client's case at the opening. What I want really is to provide the tribunal with something that they can effectively cut and paste in eventually into their award as part of their introduction. I think I'll leave it at that and pass it on now. Thank you, Frederico. Greta, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Luisa. And uh, I will echo uh, Erica and Federico, and I'm sure Pedro as well, uh, in, in thanking NYU and CAMC CBC. This is um, such a, a fun event in person, and I'm glad we can get together virtually, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that the, the next one will be uh, back in New York in person. Um, and really, my comments, I'm not going to disagree with anything that Erica and Federico have, have said. I, uh, there's reason I respect them, and they're such good ar arbitrators and practitioners, because everything they've said is completely right in, in, in my view as well. And to, to maybe just pick up specifically on something that Federico uh, mentioned, that last prong of his three, three tips that he offered um, in terms of laying out the issues and disputes, I think that one's probably one of the most critical aspects in my mind when thinking about preparing an opening and um, thinking about really what you're trying to accomplish. And what I would underscore with that and, and maybe just elaborate a minute is what is to think about what is the point of this opening? Well, the point of the opening is to set out the case so the tribunal after the hearing can go write their award. And I, I know Erica mentioned this too, to think about your purpose. Um, but what, if, if you have that clearly in mind as to what your purpose of this opening is, um, I think that that helps you think about how to structure the opening. So, you know, one easy way to think of it is you can almost think of it of a table of contents as to how you want the award to look um, in some ways. And I should just say, too, um, I know we have a range of experiences of participants today. If you've never participated in an arbitral hearing, um, I think the most common thing you see in the opening, not always, and it doesn't have to be the case, but is... Um, uh, typically one or more counsel for, for one of the parties will be giving a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, that explains the opening the case. So when I'm talking about um, a table of contents in, in your opening, I'm, what I mean basically is kind of thinking about how you're going to structure your PowerPoint. And, um, and, and in this way of structuring it, you should really lay out these issues and, and what's in dispute as Federico has, has very pointedly said. What are the exact issues that the, the tribunal needs to decide? And what are the party's positions on them? you want to say what the other side is saying, you want to say what you're saying. If you're not, if the issues are not in dispute, say that. Um, and those are the kind of things that I think are, are really, when you have in mind that the point of this at the end of the day is so the tribunal can go write a clear award 
where they're not missing any of the issues. They understand really in a simple way, what is the difference between the two parties? I think that's a good way to go in to approach the opening because not only do the arbitrators then they can take that PowerPoint and maybe use that as a table of contents for the award, but they have that in their mind as to how they're organized uh, in listening to the, the arguments, the witness testimony, looking at documents, things like that over um, the next couple of days. So for me, it's exactly what Federico and, and Erica said, but I think that aspect of, of really keeping in mind what is the purpose of the opening needs to be at the forefront of, uh, of your planning as well as how you're presenting it. Thank you, Greta. How about you, Pedro? Would, would you like to share your position? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll present a contrarian view. I'll mm -hmm. offer a view that's different from everything that's been said. And, and here's, here's what I mean. In international arbitration, the opening statement is unique. It's like no other opening statement in any other type of venue. Why is it unique? Because the lawyer can comment on the evidence, the weight of the evidence, the credibility of the evidence, the credibility of the witnesses, the legal issues, and the application of law to fact. In no other scenario, in any type of dispute resolution, methodology is a lawyer empowered to do so. So I say, present an opening statement that controls the rules of engagement for what follows, that draws the arbitral tribunal's attention to key issues through the prism of advocacy. You're not there to restate what's already in the papers. And I don't ever, ever, ever advise doing an opening statement based on chronology. I advise doing an opening statement based on conceptual hierarchy. This case is about X. Now you will hear evidence that says X, Y, and Z. And we're gonna talk about that right now, right here. And then you get straight into that evidence. And the, the tribunal, by the time you have that hearing, the tribunal has been receiving papers for approximately three years, depending <laughs> on what you're, you're discussing. The tribunal has read all of the witness statements, and I think it's fair to have an assumption that the tribunal is an educated erudite tribunal that has done some of its homework, enough to understand. So what is the purpose of oral advocacy? Persuasion, and the only way you can persuade is by fulfilling your role as an advocate in a very unique scenario that allows for this type of advocacy. Of course, credibility is critical, and you try to do that, but you want to have a situation where after you sit down, that tribunal says, if 50% of what she or he said is true, these guys and gals are right. So uh, I'm not a big proponent of PowerPoint unless you're really going to show something with PowerPoint, but not so you can read off PowerPoint or so that PowerPoint is a cue for you. PowerPoint is a demonstrative evidence. It must be used in that way. I'm not a believer in having multiple lawyers do the opening statement, no matter how complex. You wanna humanize the proceeding. You wanna connect with that arbitral tribunal. You want them to see you as the point of, of reference. So th those, are, those are issues that are important. Chronology, of course, chronology is important, but more important than chronology is the conceptual hierarchy of your thematic and equitable and legal view of the case. And that's how you wanna present it. So with that, enough fodder for thought. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, now, if we could move on to discussing the new scenario in arbitration, which is the virtual hearing. And so regarding the, the, the role of all of the characters participating in a virtual hearing, we would also like to hear from uh, your perspective on councils and tribunals. Uh, what are their roles? What is expected of them? How do you capture their attention? And um, also, if you could share maybe uh, tips on advocacy in virtual hearings. If we could start off with Greta, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, well, as, as we heard from Louisa's opening remarks, uh, virtual hearings are certainly a reality um, for all of us today. And I can, I can tell you, I, before COVID, I had had virtual segments of things. So, you know, remote witnesses um, in an otherwise in-person hearing or, um, procedural conferences by, by telephone or, or video in uh, maybe one or two rare cases. Um, I had done a virtual deposition one or two times maybe, but it really was the exception. And um, it gave, I think, everyone a lot of anxiety about not being in the same room. Um, you know, I think those anxieties maybe have faded a, a bit. Um, just myself, I, I still miss the in-person hearing. So we'll see if that, that comes back or not. 
Um, but one, just as a, an opening remark that I think to answer your question, Louisa, that I think has been an interesting discussion in preparing for this, conversa for this conversation today, as well with arbitrators and, and counsel and client um, over the last year and a half or so, is the different in perceptions of the effectiveness of oral hear he hearings versus uh, in person versus virtual. Um, and I've had this conversation with uh, multiple arbitrators and multiple counsel and client now, and it's the only uh, pool that I've taken, so take it for what it's worth, but it, there seems to be a perception that arbitrators generally think virtual hearings are as effective as in person. And I, again, that's not across the board, just the people I've talked to. Um, whereas counsel and clients have the opposite view, where they feel like they're not connecting the same way. Um, maybe the points aren't hitting home the same way. Um, uh, the arbitrators aren't aren't engaged or asking questions the same way or, or, or whatnot. But it, there seems to be a disconnection in the perceptions of whether virtual hearings are effective or, or whether they're they're not. And I raise that just to, um, as you're preparing and going through your, your case to keep that in mind. Um, you know, if the arbitrators are saying they're not, they don't feel like they're missing anything uh, more so, and uh, maybe they even think it's, it's more efficient to do this way, think about how that and how you're preparing your case. You know, you're not gonna have your Perry Mason got you moment, you're probably never gonna have that anyway, but it's, it's probably less likely that that's gonna happen virtually than it, it even would in person, which was already unlikely. But, um, it, but having that in mind, I would say, think more carefully about what are the documents you wanna show the witness? What are the documents you really wanna focus the tribunal on? Um, what are, as Frederico said, what are they really the key points of the, the contract that the, the tribunal needs to have in the forefront of their mind? Um, so it's, these aren't dissimilar to what you would do when you're preparing for an in-person hearing, but I think this idea that there is a different perception of the effectiveness um, in how virtual hearings go should be at the forefront of our minds in terms of how we're preparing and presenting the evidence through through witnesses or through the, the opening statements as well. But I'm interested to hear what my, my colleagues at the table have to say as well. Yeah, thank you, Greta. Pedro, would you like to step in? Sure, I, I agree with Greta 100%. There is a, a huge dichotomy between how arbitrators and, and based on, again, my very informal personal experience, view the, uh, the virtual hearing and what counsel and the parties and even the witnesses, particularly the expert witnesses, how they view what the virtual hearing does. And I think one of the, I think what, what we try to do is to try to understand what is it that the virtual hearing takes out of, extracts from the actual in-person hearing. I want to give you some thoughts on that because that may be very relevant in terms of how you prepare. I think that the virtual hearing takes out or extracts counsel's ability to see the dynamic of the panel members between and among themselves, which is critical to us. How are the wing arbitrators relating to the uh, Madam President of, of the panel? That's extremely, extremely important. How is the panel reacting to the witnesses? How is the panel reacting to the arguments and to the legal propositions. When are they writing things down? When aren't they? These uh, seemingly small matters actually are very, very significant. So you have to adapt to that. The second point that I think is very, very, very critical is that in these virtual hearings, lawyers uh, and experts tend to read a lot. They, they put scripts and it looks like they're talking out, you know, uh, and, and focusing on, the, on, on, on an eye-to-eye -eye content, but they're really reading. And I think that that also takes away from the advocacy. It may take away from credibility and legitimacy. And of course, I also believe that you have to change your, your cross-examination completely uh, because it's much more difficult to be able to fragment witnesses and so forth. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting dynamic that I believe materially changes advocacy. Thanks, Pedro. Erica? So, you know, not to belabor the point, but for someone who likes to be in a room and be in the people, be with people, you know, you lose, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Pedro and with Greta in terms of that inability to read the room, read the arbitrators, you know, see the dynamics between everybody. That is something that has taken some adjusting. <laughs> that being said, in terms of the pros, to the extent that you're planning ahead, you have your, you know, you have your hearing protocol, you're you're preparing with everything. The virtual hearings definitely require a lot of advanced preparation. Let's put it that way. So I think 
you know, and, and I think that there is this aspect where you are just focusing on the case. And for those of us that are used to thinking on our feet, let's be, let's be clear here. Oral argument, oral advocacy requires a lot of things to happen at the same time. You're speaking, you're thinking, you're observing, you're watching, you're on your feet. And for those of us that enjoy oral advocacy, that's what's fun. <laughs> when you're doing the virtual hearing, it's a little more methodical, but listen to what the arbitrators are saying. They're getting the information that they need. That's all that, that matters, right? But you're still trying to figure out how you can tweak on the spot and make sure that you're adjusting your presentation and being responsive. And so, you know, there are aspects in terms of being very conscious in terms of if someone's trying to speak, not speaking over the arbitrators. Um, there are aspects that you have to be careful. Um, the other thing I have to say is be flexible. Things will go wrong <laughs> and be flexible. You'll adhere to your protocol if they do. Try not to get thrown off. Um, those things can happen. Um, hopefully they don't. And the last point I'll make, and then I'll, I'll let Federico chime in as well, is be cognizant of the fact that your face and other faces are up front. It's very different from being in a room and being further away. So the littlest facial expression is seen. <laughs> so as people are talking and as you're presenting, just be mindful of that. I think that that's one aspect that's a little bit different. Um, but with that, I, you know, I invite Federico's comments as well in terms of the remote aspects. Um, thanks. I'll, I mean, I echo everything that's been said already. Um, I'll take it from a slightly different angle. So I've both sat now as an arbitrator in a virtual hearing, and I have been an advocate uh, in a virtual hearing. And I definitely agree with Greta's words. I think council probably do not like virtual hearings as much as arbitrator. When I sat as an arbitrator, it was great. I was sitting in my desk in London. Uh, you know, we don't really have to do too much at the hearing. We're sitting there absorbing things. People are presenting things on the screen for us. We don't have to flick around paper bundles, searching for the page number, or, you know, trying to find the passage that they're reading at the same time uh, that council's reading. It is great as, as an arbitrator. It is probably, possibly better than, than an in-person hearing just because everything is effectively spoon fed. Uh, you've got the witnesses right there, their faces. Uh, for those who are fans of reading witnesses, this is a co controversial subject, I know. But uh, <laughs> if you think you can read a witness, then you know having their face full on it is, is, is a great way of achieving that. As counsel, it's a whole different kettle of fish, I think, because as counsel in an in-person hearing, we have all spent years being trained and practicing in-person hearings. We know how to bring up documents. We know how to pull up that last minute document and hand it up to the tribunal. We know how to communicate with our team, turn our backs for a moment and say, is there anything else? Is there anything else that we need to say here? We know how to do the mechanics of it all. But when we come to virtual hearings, then, um, there's a lot more that can go wrong, as Erica said. You know, a virtual hearing is like a really fancy car. It might be fancy, but there's a lot more that can go wrong as well. Um, and so you have to, when you're doing your advocacy, you have to get to grips with the technology. And when I mean get to grips with the technology, I don't mean learn how to use Zoom, because I'm hoping that most people know how to use Zoom now. But what happens when there's that really bizarre glitch where, despite the fact that your microphone has worked for the 15 last audios that you've done, it seems not to work on this particular one. You haven't done anything differently. Nobody can figure it out and you've got no audio and time is ticking. So how do you, how do you fix that? Uh, and you know, the IT guy from the hearing centers tried to fix it. The IT guy at your law firm's trying to fix it. You've got your son involved because that's a last case safety net. None of it's working. Getting through those things are a practical uh, obstacle that you've got to overcome. Um, the second thing is, you know, handling the actual mechanics of the hearing. How are you going to bring up documents? How are you not? How are you going to switch from one thing to another? Uh, you know, all these kind of things you have to figure out in advance. How are you going to speak to your team? It's great uh, that you can use WhatsApp, but nobody's really paying attention to your WhatsApp when you're 
trying to figure out what you're saying, uh, trying to figure out how to bring up the next document and all these things, WhatsApp tends to go unnoticed. So finding a way of communicating with your team whilst doing that is another practical issue that you need to get over. And the final point kind of resonates with what we said, which is knowing the balance between oral and written advocacy. Um, I would say that it's not just your oral advocacy that's got to step up, it's your written advocacy as well, because of all the issues um, that come up with technology, et cetera. You want to make sure that everything is there before the tribunal. And also, you know, it's a bit weird. You can't really interrupt someone uh, on, 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 on virtual hearings. You have to really wait till they finish talking. Um, and, and so you've got to be a lot more organized in making sure you've got down every point you want to rebut on, because otherwise it can be mi missed. And before I feel that uh, in-person hearings are a lot more uh, interactive and much more of a debate or conversation, you can't really have that. They, they tend to be a sequence of little monologues. Uh, and that, that has its pros and cons, but I think very much cons for counsel and the advocate. I think I'll leave that at that now and uh, let you carry on, Louisa. Thank you, Frederico. Actually, uh, I have a question for you, if you could start, but well, anyone can step in. Paul Mason has a question from the audience to the panel. And he asked, do you see any particular differences between presenting to a panel of US or British arbitrators on one hand and Brazilian arbitrations, arbitrators on the other? So I think Frederico could go ahead and start on that. Definitely, without a doubt. Uh, I'm currently sitting on two arbitrations in particular, which I can refer to. One is a UK-US uh, arbitration, and I'm sitting with a uh, American co-arbitrator and a, and a Canadian chair. Uh, and I'm also sitting in another arbitration, which is Brazilian seated in Portuguese with a Portuguese chair and a Brazilian co-arbitrator. Um, so, you know, we talk about sort of common civil law divides and that's, that's for sure that exists. And if I start with my Brazilian, and I'm talking about the arbitrator perspective now rather than counsel perspective, but I have been the odd one out uh, without a doubt in the Brazilian seated uh, arbitration until we got to the substantive hearing. When we were procedurally, I almost inherently disagreed with my co-arbitrators in almost every decision we made up until we got to the hearing. When we got to the hearing and we're deciding about the substance of the case, the material issues and disputes, we all converged again. And it's funny how whether you common law, English, American, whatever it is your approach, um, we all decided the issues pretty much, or we all came to the relatively equal conclusions. We weren't that far apart. Uh, with the uh, American, um, I, I sit as an arbitrator, I also sit as a judge for uh, depositions from uh, cases in the US. Um, the approach in the US, I think, is, is it would be unfair for me to say there is one US approach. I, I have found divergent approaches from New York to California to Texas to wherever. So um, the, the, the fact that you have a, a state system and you have 50 states, I think makes for differences in how people write their statements of case, in how people cross-examine, uh, and how they conduct their oral advocacy. I, I mean, in general, I would say I personally find, and I'm sure I have three Americans here that will come down on me like a ton of bricks, but I find the Americans um, more, more aggressive, let's say, more, they, they fight their client's corner we're a lot more vigorously than um, us English barristers, I would say. So they certainly um, wear their, their client's case a lot more. I, 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 that's my layman's perspective. <laughs> would any of the Americans like to respond? Well, I'll be true to form and be aggressive and disagree with Federico right away. <laughs> but um, with, with that, I would, I would say, Maybe just, I think, a, a pulling out something that Federico picked up on, and um, you, I, we, you know, we, Eric and I, we discussed this in our planning call for this too. I think often it's not so much the where the arbitrators are, are from that's um, impacting how you're presenting or which arguments you're making. It's more recognition of the forum that you're in um, 
at least for me. And what I mean by that is, is probably what Federico was getting at is, you know, if, if I'm in US court or if I'm in a deposition um, and, you know, if it's a court proceeding, whether it's an oral or written advocacy, I think I can objectively admit that my writing and advocacy is more aggressive probably than I would do um, uh, in, in, uh, in our international arbitration proceedings. Um, and I, even as an American counsel, I've been in international arbitrations with counsel on the other side that is more traditionally a US litigation uh, practitioner, a trial practitioner in the US. And um, I've seen them try to bring that very aggressive uh, kind of bombastic, particularly in the openings, uh, I think maybe taking Pedro's advice too far <laughs> uh, for the opening statements too, too aggressive. And it, it really falls flat, I think, in, in an international arbitration setting. So. It, at least for me, I think it is a fair statement that Americans can be more more aggressive. But I, I think the key is not to think that the American arbitrators want that, but to understand the the forum that you're in and, and what's I, I hesitate to say expected uh, because we pride ourselves on the flexibility. But, you know, some some way of presenting things work better in some forms and they don't. And I think that that aggressive um, attitude or approach will fall flat often in, in arbitration, even if you have American arbitrators. I, I agree. And sitting as an arbitrator, I have to say it's incredibly uncomfortable when you're witnessing that type of behavior. And we try to curb it, throw some subtle hints, but you know, do know that it's being taken into account and, and we're seeing it and we're thinking of it. And I know also as counsel, I've been in that position. Greta is incredibly, you know, it's exactly what we were talking about in terms of the forum, know your forum. And as a litigator and also as an arbitrator, you know, counsel in both, yeah, you're in different places. There are different strategies, different ways that you advocate if you're in court um, versus in arbitration. And I think it's important to be mindful. You know, arbitration does does pri does have a priority for deference and, and for collegiality. I do see the distinction also, you know, even though I'm an American counsel, I practice an international, I see the way things are done. But it's funny, even being in, in completely different panels, you know, I've been doing a fair amount in, in other jurisdictions, particularly in Singapore, you know, you see different styles and it's a matter of just communicating your point, but there are no aha gotcha moments. And in fact, those aha gotcha moments lose you points with the arbitration tribunal if, if you're in, in, you know, in an arbitration. And procedurally, I think it's also important to note you are not in court. <laughs> the procedural aspect, sometimes I, I, I joke because I feel like we're in some sort of, um, you know, litigation on crack, right? You're in an arbitration scenario and all of these things are being requested that don't necessarily make sense in an arbitration. And so balancing your requests, thinking through what you really need and what you don't, not only substantively, but knowing that all of your interactions will frame how you're received and perceived by the tribunal. So I don't know if, you know, if anybody else wants to add anything. Yeah, Just very, very briefly, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think it's critical to understand that there's an arbitral culture so that uh, there are expectations from the arbitral that arise from the culture of arbitration, irrespective of the origins or the background that the, the excuse me, that, that the different arbitrators may have. So I agree, first of all, yes, I do think that you speak differently to different sets of actual technical expectations from the configuration of the arbitral panel. I think you have to take that into account, particularly when understanding the, the, the evidence and how to present the evidence and how to judge the evidence. But also you have to be very sensitive to the culture of arbitration and the culture of arbitration certainly is not the culture of an American trial law. Uh, that, that, those, those two things have nothing to, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, uh, oil and vinegar. That, that has nothing, one thing has nothing to do with the other. If you understand arbitral culture, then you'll even understand that it also depends on how you plead your case, also depends on the type of arbitration. I would submit to all of us here that an international commercial arbitration is not pled in the same way as an invest, investor state dispute. ISDS is a completely different angle. The briefing is different, and I think the oral advocacy is also very different, uh, in large measure because of, uh, of pub, the, the application of public international law, the law of all countries and no single country in particular. So uh, I think all these factors have to be taken into account. But the, the takeaway always in advocacy and arbitration is that 
foremost, you must pay attention to something that's not written anywhere and is not taught anywhere and is not contained in any code, which is the culture of arbitration. And that culture of arbitration embodies the expectations of all concerned. Thank you, Pedro. Now, going back a little bit on the point that Greta and Erica were making in the beginning regarding the different perspective, uh, I mean, the, the different experience from counsel and arbitrators, uh, that anxiety that Greta was talking about, uh, we have a question from Anna Benetti. So in light of this different uh, difference of perspectives about virtual hearings, what can arbitrators do or should do to make lawyers and parties feel that they are well, they're actually getting the message through. I think that's a tricky one. <laughs> you know, I will say Zoom fatigue, whatever platform fatigue, it, it occurs for arbitrators. Think about it, they're just sitting and listening. As much as Federico has said that it's nice and it's convenient, sitting and listening for hours and hours is hard. <laughs> um, in terms of giving feedback, it's really hard because you don't want to jeopardize any impartiality, right? So I'm very careful with my questioning. You know, you have to be very careful. Um, so I, I don't know if others have, have other comments, but I'll start with that. Any other tips? Um, I mean, if I bring again my, you know, I think a lot of arbitration is still very much influenced by the litigation in your home nation. Uh, and I think um, one of the things I do uh, think is really helpful, actually, uh, is instead of written post-hearing briefs, it's actually oral closing. Because in my opinion, oral closing is, as Pedro said, you know, you're not repeating what's already been written. Um, oral advocacy for me it is, uh, Something I learned over the course of my marriage is that, uh, you know, it's not about arguing, which is perhaps the pre preemptive conception that, that most people have as to what oral advocacy is, arguing your point. Um, you do have to be right, but it's not about arguing your point. It's often about explaining your point. And so it's a much more subtle, much more cooperative, uh, very differently put. And, and the problem with post-hearing briefs that are written is it doesn't give arbitrators the opportunity to really ask the questions that they want. And it doesn't give advocates the opportunity to really explain the point. You know, the thing about international arbitration, as we say, is that we come from all different backgrounds and we have different ways of putting the case that we're trying to put. Um, and that may not always align itself with the way that a panel of arbitrators will absorb the point or get the point. So oral closings for me are even more important in international arbitration than they are in any system of litigation because where you have these cultures and clashes of cultures, it allows both the panel of arbitrators and the council to engage. And that means that council can get some feedback by trying to interpret the questions that the, the arbitrators are asking. And, and if it becomes a debate and an explanation, you can really see what the arbitrators are struggling with or what they're not, and you could put your case and adapt it accordingly. So I, I, that's one observation for me. I think for me, I would just add, um, you know, this is a question I think that exists, uh, whether you're virtual or in person um, in, in general. Did, did, was the hearing effective and did the, did the tribunal get what you wanted them to get? Um, and maybe a variation on what Federico was saying that I found helpful in some cases is where the tribunal uh, where we don't have uh, oral closing statements, but we do have post-hearing briefs, but the tribunal has provided questions or, or um, topics for the council to focus on, um, which, which I found very helpful. And you know, you don't want to provide a, a massive post-hearing brief for, on the tribunal on topics they don't think are relevant or they fully understood already. So um, that sort of direction in, in whatever it's closing, I think, uh, whether it's a closing statement or a post-hearing brief is, is helpful. Um, it, when the tribunal can give some direction as to what they're interested in or where there's still questions. Well, thank you, Greta. Actually, uh, that ties me to my next question, which I would like to pose to Pedro. So why are oral arguments important in light of the written submissions? So what would be the limit on raising arguments not contained in the papers? 
Well, I think, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I think, first of all, that there's there's a difference between raising arguments and raising issues that contain in, in the papers. Then sometimes this is a very, very uh, nebulous dividing line. But um, the purpose of oral advocacy, I think, is is, is critical. It's, it's to clarify, that's one point, what's written. It's to challenge otherwise untested assumptions in the written material. Uh, and it's to contextualize as well as to prioritize in ways that are not possible with the written word. And if you take everything that I've said right now and you add it up, that equals persuasion, that equals credibility. Uh, when you can contextualize an argument, when you can clarify an argument, when you're opening and, and making yourself exposed or vulnerable to testing untested assumptions so that that panel can actually go into these issues in depth beyond what's just in writing, uh, that's critical. The foundational question is what you've asked. If in fact you have presented your entire case in writing and you are prescribed as a matter of law or practice from raising new issues, then what is the point of, of oral advocacy? And what, what, I, what I suggest is uh, that, that it's these, these factors, clarity, uh, context, um, delving into untested assumptions and, and, and ultimately persuasion. And that's why just, just to maybe tie this up to the post-hearing briefs a little bit, uh, I'm very much against post-hearing briefs precisely because I think they create more, they're, they're more expensive, they create, they, they jack up the price of the proceedings. But beyond that, uh, they get you, they remove the, the, the tribunal from the moment of the hearing. And you also have the, the issue, again, all the issues, you don't have oral advocacy on those post-hearing post briefs. And you also run the risk, the perennial risk of raising new issues or new arguments in ways that were not accorded due process because they weren't part of, of replies, because they weren't part of like more extensive briefing. And because ultimately there was no accountability in the form of a hearing. I hope that helps. Thank you, Pedro. Actually, now we have, we have a question from the audience. We have a question from Yanis Tsiligakis. Um, and I would like to maybe present that to Erica. So the relation of arbitration outcomes to setting up precedents, but also influence future arbitration proceedings. Have you seen the concept of legal precedent applied or invoked during arbitration proceedings? Can every arbitration be seen as a new case or as a link in a chain of legal precedent? more concise yeah there, there you go so erica what's your take on that <laughs> thank you so I, I think it's a really interesting question and we don't have that much time to go into it but it, the concept of precedent in arbitration is a tricky one right why Com arbitration is confidential arbitration is usually done um, behind closed doors what is our moment where arbitration becomes public enforcement right when it goes through the courts in terms of enforcement we start to see a snippet when the law, substantive law is chosen, we are referring to the substantive law of that jurisdiction. So the, that's the precedent we rely on. But we also have to think about the distinction between civil and common law. Common law tends to rely more on precedent, case precedent. Civil law tends to rely on codes and rules. And in arbitration, we see a mixture of the two. The other thing I think that's interesting in arbitration is we rely more heavily on scholarship. Right? So it's a little bit more academic than we would see in, in typical litigation. Um, but I think your question in terms of precedent is becoming more and more interesting these days as we're seeing multiple arbitrations. You know, we have complex disputes that come before us. And despite how much we try and talk to our clients ahead of time about contracting in a way that they have consistent clauses, I'm sure Louisa does this on a daily basis, we have divergent clauses and there are related issues that take us to one arbitration tribunal versus another, or maybe even litigation. How do we deal with that? This is actually something I'm dealing with currently. How do we deal with that in terms of precedent? Is there estoppel? Is there preclusion? You know, what, what do we do? And I will tell you, this is a ripe area for lawyers. It's unsettled, <laughs> it's gray, and we work through it. But I think that's a really excellent question and one you know, that we could probably devote a full panel to. So I thank you for that question. Thank you, Erica. Frederico, would you like to comment? Thanks, Louisa. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to be quite forthright on that. And uh, 
just say my own personal opinion, which is I don't think there is a place for binding precedence in international arbitration um, for the reasons that Erica have given, has given already, which is A, um, the, 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 the risk of holding arbitral awards as precedence, if that's, if that's what the question is, as I understood it, is that A, you don't get the full picture because you don't really get all, all the arbitral awards. Secondly, even when you do get the picture, uh, as Erica said, sometimes you only get a snippet of the award and not the entire award. And you really need to understand the full reasoning of an award to be able to hold it even as a precedent. Uh, thirdly, it impeaches on uh, one of the fundamental principles, I think, of arbitration, which is that the arbitrators are only bound by their own legal framework, which applies to that arbitration. Uh, and unless the parties expressly uh, agree that the, the, the precedent system, which is normally only applies to a particular system of law. So, you know, the English precedent system applies for English law, the American. So to apply that globally uh, would, would favor one system over another. And so what if you've got one Supreme Court precedent from the English courts and one Supreme Court uh, precedent from the US courts, which are you know, diametrically opposed. So which, which precedent, therefore, uh, should you apply? If it's binding, the tribunal is bound to apply one, and, and which one is it going to be? So there's a whole host of problems, I think, with having a binding precedent system uh, in international arbitration, but more so um, the fact that, yeah, I think arbitrators uh, have uh, to exercise their discretion. So it can be influential, and of course, um, arbitrators may choose to follow the reasoning of a particular precedent um, because it assists them in reasoning their own arbitral award, but to be bound by it, I think, is very, very dangerous. So I would say no. Thank you, Federico. Greta, would you like to make your final comments on this point? Well, with these points, I, I will uh, not disagree. I just fully <laughs> agree with uh, Erica and, and Federico on this. I think. Um, you know, depending on whether you're in, in commercial or investor state, there's um, certainly discussion whether um, the extent to which uh, awards and decisions in investor state cases can and should have precedential value. And, you know, the reality is that I think if you read um, one award to the next, they, they do have some. Um, you know, I, in the commercial context, we see it much less. And I think for all the reasons of Frederica and, and Erica, have discussed um, it. It makes sense. Um, you know, I, I will just say there there are there are some exceptions. You see that sometimes. So uh, my firm, in addition to general international arbitration, we do quite a bit of um, of um, domestic and international arbitration in the insurance and reinsurance context. And there are some areas like that where you do see um, some more precedent. I would say, or precedent light maybe in in the area of, of the the law. And the reason for that is. Um, the vast majority of those cases don't end up in court. So if you don't use um, prior decisions from the arbitrations, there's no uh, advancement of the law, I, I guess, in, in some ways. So the, the, the majority of those decisions are being are resolved in, in um, arbitration. Um, it also works in those fields because there's there tends to be a smaller group of people that are practicing in those. So for better or for worse, everyone knows everything that's happening, I guess, in everyone. Um, so it, it's a little bit more accessible, but you know, in, a general, in general commercial cases, um, it's it's hard to have precedent precedents from awards where not everyone has access to that award. Um, there's not really review of that of that award the same way you would have in courts to confirm whether the legal decisions were correct or not. Um, and there's a lot of uh, in in inherent risk. I would say if you open the floodgates to let um, general commercial arbitration have the same precedential value, for example, as as courts and judges do in domestic systems. Thank you so much, Greta. Well, thank you, everyone. I think this was very um, interesting. No one snoozing in the audience, so that is a win. <laughs> we will now move on to a very brief networking session. And I would like to suggest a first topic of conversation over there, which would be um, if you have any disastrous or any interesting stories regarding these recent um, virtual hearings, and of course, after this networking session, we will have another fantastic panel for you, which will be called Arbitration War Stories, what the, book don't, what the books don't teach you. 
not to mention the keynote speech afterwards by Professor Franco Ferrari, which I am personally very much looking forward to, and which will be on the impact of anti-COVID measures on substantive law solutions. So uh, hopefully we'll get a very interesting perspective by Professor Franco Ferrari after second panel. So see you in a couple of minutes. Everyone here will be randomly assigned to rooms over here on Zoom. And so please bear with us and don't, don't move. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this next um, session. I'd like to go ahead and invite our speakers for this session to um, unpause their video and unmute and join me on the stage. <laughs> we are talking today, Arbitration War Stories, What the Books Don't Teach You. Let me make sure I see all of my speakers on. OK, I think I do. Uh, very good. So let's jump in. We have a short session as they are back to back and we do not want to abut into Franco's time. So here we go. Brief introductions. These speakers are very well known to you, uh, but just in case. Marcello Roberto Ferro, partner at Ferro Castro Neves Daltro and Gomide Avocados in Rio. Christian Leithley, partner at Herbert Smith Freehills in New York, head of the Latin American group and US head of international arbitration. Rose Rameau, Principal and Managing Partner at Rameau International Law. Rose serves as both counsel and independent arbitrator and mediator in commercial and ISDS matters and is a barrister and solicitor for the Supreme Court of Ghana. And last but not least, Guillermo de Sena Costa. He is an associate in the International Dispute Resolution Group at Deva Voice in Plimpton's New York office. My name is Reka Rangachari. I am the Master of Ceremonies for this segment. Um, I am the Executive Director of NIAC, the New York International Arbitration Center. So we have been tasked with this, asking our speakers to share candid experiences using real cases, confidential materials, redacted of course, to recount their approaches to interesting, thorny and difficult situations that you may see in your practice. Of course, we want audience participation, so, Use the emojis at the bottom of your screen where appropriate, post your questions into the chat and we will take them as time permits. With that, topic number one, dealing with clients and political pressers. I'm gonna go first um, to Christian here on the oligarch and witness statement issues you may have seen. Pray tell, when have you seen this and what happened in that case? Thank you, thank you uh, for all those involved today and uh, to the organizers record thank you very much um yes so uh very early on in my career i learned the hard way that um sometimes you can have some fairly significant clients who are quite uh, a presence uh, oligarchs are included in them there are many across the region and i'm sure there is a oligarch equivalent in brazil that has a has a phrase uh, better than an empresario but um, the difficulty I faced is that we were involved in an arbitration where there were a series of uh, employees within a group who had worked for this oligarch who were providing witness statements in an arbitration. And in the last minute, obviously, in a filing, we had to submit all of our witness statements. And we sent them to this final client to, to bless them. He came back with a number of changes and then asked to introduce all of these changes to which I responded, that's absolutely fine, but I'll have to go back to the witnesses to make sure that they are approved. And this, from this point ensued a very tense series of exchanges with this oligarch who felt that it was his right to define what the final witness statement should say. Uh, and when I quizzed him about why he was making certain changes, he just felt that it was the better way to say things, of course. I couldn't accept this. And I, I, I remember very clearly being a junior arbit, uh, arbitration associate 
thinking, well, I have a very simple choice to make in life here. I either go the way of losing my license, uh, but keeping a client happy, or I stick to the line and I decided to stick to the line. And I said to the oligarch, I'm very sorry, I can't take any of your changes and we can't submit it without the witnesses signing off on their and approving all of the changes. So he got extremely upset. This is an individual who I can't share the name of, but was subsequently found, uh, a, a large amount of his blood was found on his doorstep in his villa in Spain, having suspiciously been, they think, killed, having been embroiled in all sorts of tangles with a very, very high uh, level officials within Russia. So this was someone I didn't really want to mess around with, but unfortunately I had to and lay down the law. And this, perhaps for those of you uh, students here and, and young practitioners, I, I still am very grateful that I, I made that, that call. This was a, a very, very powerful person who really didn't like being told no, but in the long run, I felt it was, it was the much better approach. So that was certainly one uh, political pressure and sensitive point of dealing with a client which I had to face. I'm gonna to move to Marcello. Thank you so much, Christian. To Marcello on um, foreign language testimony uh, by a client, any insights here, pitfalls, benefits, or otherwise? We can't hear you, Marcello, if you don't. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So thank you, Rekha, for the opportunity. So the idea is, uh, you might remember that movie that was advocate when Al Pacino says, that vanity is my preferred sin. So sometimes you have to deal with your client and your client pretends that he or she is fluent in a foreign language. So, and this is the major problem because uh, even the best speaker by addressing an arbitral tribunal in a formal way, sometimes he or she can lose some strength on the deposition. So you have to to give uh, a wise advice to the client in order to suggest that he or she, albeit being a native uh, in, in that foreign language, testify in, in his own language, in his mother tongue. And this can be, uh, cannot be a problem if the witness and the client takes your suggestion, but can be disastrous when the client thinks otherwise. Uh, so we tend to suggest to the client uh, by in a written form sometimes just to give an idea that how serious we are with respect to that advice that the client should testify in, the, in he or she, uh, his or her mother tongue, especially when they are not fluent, but they pretend they are fluent. So we tend to say to them to be formal, but act natural. And sometimes, Rekha, I had uh, some problems related to Brazilian clients that tend to be too natural. And as a matter of an anecdote, and since we are in a panel related to war stories, I remember once that uh, my client was, pretty, uh, he deeply wants to testify in English, but he had a poor English. For the Brazilian practitioners, uh, Mr. Joel Santana was a Shakespearean uh, English speaker if you compare to my, to, to my client. So at that time, the client was not only addressing the tribunal in a very poor English, but even worse, Rekha, he addressed the tribunal using Brazilian proverbs, which the sense was completely incomprehensible. So sometimes he said that uh, in this moment, your honor, he called the, the arbitrators your honor, is the moment that the cow, the cow went to the swamp. And there was no relation to that, only but the Brazilian uh, members of the audience would understand that, that proverb. Uh, and in the, in the further moment, uh, he addressed the, the tribunal by saying that he showed the evidence to, 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 the other, to, to his adversary, because with him, he killed the snake and showed the stick, which is a Brazilian proverb that makes no sense at all. So at the end of the day, he claimed that he was, he, he gave a very good deposition, uh, but we unfortunately understand otherwise and needless to say that we lost the case. These are tough instances. And I think the VIS students are often told their tenacity to use idioms of their own language when translated may not deliver the punch that they really mean it to. 
Um, thank you so much, Marcello. We're going to go quickly to Rose on this um, topic as well, dealing with clients' political pressures of the similar ilk that we asked Christian. Rose, if you'd share, you know, when you receive instructions from sovereign clients, what are considerations that you think of, whether they're ethical or dealing with the common civil law divide and scrutiny? Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you for inviting me today. Okay. Um, for the uh, political pressure, um, I think um, what I've dealt with is sometimes when, I, uh, when the client is trying to request that you file a particular motion before the I've had access to the file you know it's bogus, you know you shouldn't file that. But because um, aid, you're all being caught between, do you follow what your client wants you to do? Or um, as the lawyer, you have the job to bring uh, real issues before the tribunal, not just anything. So I've, I've dealt with those um, situation and where they threaten to change you as counsel, for instance, you have to be you have to be strong and you have to sit down with the client and say, look, um, under the rules, under the law, this is what it says. This tribunal has, has not done anything for you to file a challenge. This is what it is. And it's it's very hard to convince them because already they feel if they have um, a different lawyer, maybe they hired a different lawyer before and they feel this would have been done. And I try to explain, you, you cannot just go and challenge the tribunal or file any bogus motion. It needs to be some kind of merit. Otherwise you, you put yourself in a situation where the tribunal does not like you and your client. And you try to explain that, and it's get that concept. One thing I want to say um, regarding the um, foreign language, I sat at our, as a chapter one, and um, the translator was basically not translating what um, she was supposed to translate. But she didn't know that I spoke Spanish. She didn't know that I understood because uh, whatever she was saying that was, so I had to take a recess and take a break and pull the counsels and, and explain to the counsel that the translator better say, because for the record, the, the translator better say exactly what the witness is saying. So that's, that's, um, that's what I would say regarding those, those two issues, Rekha, without mentioning my clients or the case. <laughs> No, no, not being asked to do that. We made the disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> um, to, in law, in truth, as an advocate, you have to be both an offensive and a defensive team player. We're moving into the next segment. This is quick fire. Please feel free to use your chats at the bottom so we stay engaged with you. Now, the topic is, um, excuse me. Uh, the clash of cultures and conflicting legal traditions. I'm going to begin here with Guy, having studied across jurisdictions. Can you share some insights, you know, having this myriad different access points to education than actually practicing both in Brazil and in the U.S.? What are some nuances you've seen? Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation in the first place. Uh, jumping right into that question, which I guess kind of straddles even uh, the prior topic of how to deal with clients, because I think these cultural differences, they really play out uh, when you're taking instructions and, and acting for clients. Uh, but in my experience, I think the two things uh, that most shed light on the cultural differences between what we would call sort of common law and, and, and civil law jurisdictions, in my, in my experience, that would be mostly the US and Brazil, uh, but they tend to be, on the one hand, the approach to cross-examination and on the other hand, uh, document production. Um, now, of course, things like the IBA rules have come a long way in setting up what might be viewed as a consensus on these issues. But in practice, and especially being with clients and not sophisticated counsel in, in, in the various jurisdictions, you often have uh, some difficulty of, of language, I would say, 
right? Not language per se in, in the words that you're speaking, but in getting these ideas across. Uh, so I think for somebody like me, who's been sort of on both sides of that wall, uh, it's today quite easy to see and understand that when you're speaking to a Brazilian client about document production, it will be a very alien sort of idea that you'd have this massive and very intrusive, uh, you know, discovery exercise, even an arbitration where, of course, it's not like U.S. court litigation. Uh, but that, in my experience, then requires uh, sort of heightened uh, 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 scrutiny and attention to how you communicate these things to the client in advance so that you set the right level of expectations. Because in my experience, what I often see is some common law practitioners may simply assume that uh, you know, a Brazilian party or a Peruvian party or a Chilean party will be, uh, will be ready to play ball because that's how we grew up here, right? Uh, and then when push comes to shove during document production, you have all sorts of uh, political pressures from the client and resistance on producing documents. Um, now, what, one, one thing that you might want to consider in that type of situation, if you reverse the situation and you're representing a common law based uh, a client against a, a client in civil law jurisdictions, or perhaps sometimes even sovereign states for whom, you know, producing documents is something more sensitive and difficult is, you know, in a couple of our arbitrations, what we've done is we propose, let's not do document production at all, because then you at least try to sort of level the playing field in a situation where, because you're a New York based lawyer, you've been trained and you grew up in this tradition, you're going to do a very forthcoming, very uh, expansive production of your own documents, but maybe, and it's not, I don't mean to speak ill of the, like the professional competence of people on the other side. It is, I think, really this cultural difference, but you wouldn't expect as forthcoming and disclosure from the other side. So, so maybe that's one way to level the playing field. Um, and I know I'm sort of going over my time, but just two words on cross-examination. Um, I think, I think in my experience, it really, this really comes alive when you see tribunals that are either full uh, fully composed of common law uh, members or civil law members or mixed. And it especially comes alive when uh, you see the president's approach to sort of disciplining the cross-examination. When you have a witness that's pontificating on the stand, uh, as a common law trained lawyer, you want to rein in that witness and, and discipline him or her, right? And make him or her answer the question. And I think you really see a, a cultural clash in the sense that civil law trained uh, arbitrators will give the witness a lot more leeway, whereas a common law trained arbitrator will try and rein the testimony in. And again, these are things that you might want to consider strategically as counsel, including perhaps to agree uh, on a sort of protocol in advance with the other Apologies, I had a little bit of a, a misstep there, uh, but including, uh, for instance, to agree on a protocol with the other side in advance of the hearing as to, you know, what is expected of cross examinations and how uh, and how the tribunal is going to deal with that. So th those are essentially my uh, two cents on that. We'll stick with this idea of cr the dreaded cross examination or or the most helpful cross examination, however you want to um, slice it. Christian, we'll go to you because I know you have some more stories on this, including the common and civil law divide as we go between the US and UK styles um, and those um, on civil law, including Brazil. Thanks, Rekha. Yeah, I have practiced arbitration both in the US and the UK and grown up mostly in the US practice, to be honest. I worked, I used to work in my junior arbitration years with Gary Bourne, uh, a, a well-known US arbitrator, and at Wilma Cutler Pickering, as it was at the time, a lot of US litigators and arbitration practitioners who were based there. So I have to say, I was schooled more in the US style of arbitration, which I found to be more effective. And then when I moved to the US, and I'm now based in New York, although the backdrop wouldn't suggest it, um, I very much have adopted the US style, which is um, slightly more aggressive, not necessarily in the in the manner of the presentation, but in the way of approaching information gathering, which is to catch out witnesses. I, I learned to my peril that the classic English style is really quite different. And uh, this is ironic given I'm an English lawyer as well, and I'm originally from England. So when I was appearing for a Brazilian client in, in a London seated arbitration, English law, I was using very much an American style of cross-examination, whereas you have some very closed questions and you're only expecting a yes or no answer. And you can basically then piecemeal your answers to reach the conclusion you want to corner your witness or your expert. By contrast, an English style, and this perhaps explains why some of the formulations of questions come as I put it to you, 
is there's almost an ethical obligation to propose, a, to propose something to allow the witness to respond accordingly. So you have to put a proposition and you can't necessarily catch out the individual witness or expert in such a, in such a, a way that you might in the US. That's something that I think is still um, a point of tension in arbitration because you have so many transatlantic arbitrators British arbitrators in the US, American arbitrators in the UK, and many serving on tribunals on either side of the Atlantic. And so the question is what style should be adopted? I personally have found the US style to be way more effective. However, I do sympathize with the ethic behind, the ethical rule behind the UK style, which is to allow a witness a proper opportunity to understand the type of question that is being put to him or her. So for me, that was that was quite an education. I remember being in particular being slapped down pretty hastily by a retired high court judge who really didn't like the way that I had come, uh, sort of joined up a series of questions. And then when at the end, I had put a proposition to the witness thinking I had caught that witness out, the, the judge, the chair uh, interrupted me and said, how did you reach that conclusion based on what you had, what, what you said, you've yet to put the proposition to the witness. So I unfortunately had to transparently unravel everything that I had felt that I had achieved, to which point the hands were thrown in the air by the judge, uh, who's horrified to see not least this Englishman abusing the cross-examination style from England. So, so the, the lesson learned is to call everything a common law style is, is to dumb it down. There are some nuances between different common law countries as much as there are between civil law and common law. And we're seeing that tension, the IBA and Prague rules as students who are delving in, we are excited to hear more, more about your applications of the Prague rules so we can tease out uh, the nuances of this divide. Um, let's go next, um, Marcello. We were talking about um, how we deal with the clash of cultures and dealing with witness prep, even looking to witness statements, oral versus written. Any insights here? Yeah, Rebecca, I understand that uh when you have to, to address uh, a witness preparation and whether or not to use a written statement or oral statement is something, something similar to a dress code to go to a party. So if you are too formal, then you risk not to enjoy the party. Whereas if you go too informal, too casual, uh, the risk is even higher. So I understand that, uh, I, and I believe Erica Levin mentioned this in the prior panel, by mentioning that you have to engage with the tribunal immediately. And by, by, by engaging with the tribunal is to understand what kind of style you should use in this kind of preparation and in this kind of approach related to the witness. So if you have, for example, uh, a panel formed by mostly or in, or in its entirety by common lawyers, needless to say that you have to use the written statement because uh, they, they would not understand a different approach or they would have more difficulty to understand a different approach. Whereas on the opposite, when you have a panel formed mostly by civil, by civil lawyers, you can use oral statements. And uh, I believe my Brazilian friends would quote me on that that what we see on the domestic case, very high sophisticated cases, but what we see here is a kind of Americanization of the written statement without the practice of the, our fellow mates from, from UK and from, from US. What, what I mentioned with this is the fact that normally this kind of use, uh, or I would say improper use of written statement by those who are not completely fluent with that style may lead to a disastrous outcome. What, what I mean is that Brazilian arbitrators tend to rely more on oral statements because at the end it's when you have the witness without any kind of help for the lawyer because everyone knows that the witness statements are somewhat whether fully prepared by the lawyers or uh, mostly helped by the lawyers. So you, you tend to be more persuasive, in my opinion, when you have uh, a witness testifying on his or her own words uh, as natural as he or she can be. 
because the, 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 the improper use of the witness statement, as I mentioned, by some practitioners leads to a different situation, or I, I think that they have a very bad situation, which is the fact that the witness statements is four page long, six page long, but the deposition takes four, five, six hours, because there is a tendency of not addressing too much points on the witness statement and trying to use as a matter of strategy, the, the, the witness to present new facts at, at, during the deposition without giving the opportunity to the adversary to have addressed those points uh, beforehand. So what we call in some, uh, in some uh, hearings, what we call the selective amnesia. So the witness sometimes we can, rem uh, can remember, is able to remember uh, the date, uh, the specific time of the day and what the other party was addressing but he cannot or she cannot remember other important facts because these important facts will jeopardize uh, the party's uh, case. So the idea for, for the use of oral or written statements is to exactly to address the tribunal in the proper way and try to use the case management conference to understand whether or not the tribunal is keen to receive or it would be more uh, inclined to receive written statement instead of oral statement. I like very much the notation of selective amnesia. What happens when we're not in proceedings and we personally have it? I beg you all to think about that in parallel. We go to Rose to finish off this segment. Um, Rose, you know, Marcello talked about engagement between the tribunal, between the council, between the witnesses. Um, and so can you tease out some examples here how even as a tribunal member, you deal with engagement, but also any thoughts you'd like to share on the civil common law divide, the IBA rules in general, taking of evidence and what that means in different scenarios, please. Thanks, Rico. Um, as a, um, when I am a member of the tribunal, whether I sit, mainly as sole arbitrator, the very first thing that I do when I'm, um, like last year I had a case where it was a mixed civil law, common law lawyers uh, before me. And um, when I drafted my TOR, I just, I just put in there that the parties would agree to the use of the IBA rules on the taking of the evidence. And then after I finished with, with my TOR, I submitted it to the clients, to the, to the um, councils, and then I asked the councils to comment on it. We had a whole full um, uh, preliminary hearing on, on it. Some, uh, of course, common law, common law uh, uh, lawyers wanted the IBA. It was similar, the civil law felt like it was too, too much common law and not um, enough of the hybrid. So finally, I convinced them to, um, to accept that. And what I've realized, um, I carved out which part of the IB rules um, I want to focus on and how I wanted the, the proceeding to, because I didn't want any, 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 um, um, any fishing expedition. I didn't want, I wanted things to be clear. And I think I succeeded because once the, the, the French lawyers realized that I was not going to allow them asking for the past 10 years or the past five years, it was going to be specific, they were okay with it. And the other thing under this, um, there's this, it says he who alleges must prove it. And they take that um, uh, article very, very seriously in, uh, in arbitration you will see when you receive the, the um, uh, notice for arbitration, um, the common, the civil law lawyers will just have their statements and everything that has to go with it. Um, but with the common law, they will, they are waiting to have some form of discovery. And, and it's, it's very hard to to, to combine the two sometimes because um, once the French lawyers or civil law um, lawyers, they've submitted everything, they don't think there's anything else to do. And meanwhile, uh, the common law uh, lawyers would feel like there was a hole in the testimony. They need to find out 
they need to um, have some form of discovery. I think with arbitration, that's what I like about it. When I take the IBA rules, I can stop all this um, nonsense before the tribunal and, and get what I need because my job is to manage the, the proceeding and resolve the matter. Now, there was one little anecdote I'll say, uh, Rekha, many, many, many years ago, I was counsel instructed by um, a, a firm in the United States, corporate in the United States, but, uh, but they were accused of violation of the French liberal law in, in, in Paris. And I was instructed to represent the US um, company. And basically they have purchased a company in Paris and under the French liberal law, when you purchase a company, purchase the CEO of the company, everybody, because France is a, is a socialist country, you can't just fire people. Meanwhile, in the US, it's more like employment. There was a new sheriff on the block, you see everybody, you replace everybody. Um, the US company did not do that. They follow as much as they could. However, they did not hire the CEO of the French company. Now, they brought in their own manager, their own So the CEO of the French company now was suing the US corporation saying that they were a violation of uh, French liberal law. And I got that. As also on the case, it was very, very difficult to, to get to the truth of the matter. It's not like the US violated, the, the US company violated. It's because they had somewhat hearsay evidence that this CEO has gotten the severance paid. Um, and they've paid already, so we don't need to hire you. And after all, we didn't like the way the company was being ran. So I had no way to find out that information. So what I had to do is use my US tactics, although not admitted in France. And I basically met with people in the company and and interview them and, and, and got all the hearsay evidence. And I had nothing to go through uh, because nobody wanted to, to write a, a form of statement because they were afraid to be fired. So I did what most US lawyers would do among themselves, but this time I had to. I call up and I say, hey, um, guess what? I discovered the truth. Your client is lying. He has gotten 500 um, uh, he's got this, he's got that. And guess what? He's going to be very embarrassed before this uh, tribunal tomorrow coming forward. He got scared, they dismissed the case. <laughs> I got lucky because technically I threatened them. And I think sometimes US lawyers they do that with each other. They, they, they do have something, but they don't know how to prove it yet. They, the opposing counsel, well, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. That, that's a very good, um, that was a very good outcome for me in that case. Over my time, I don't know if you want me to speak anymore, so I, I'll stop there. Well, I think, um, you know, as we move into sort of the last segment that's imbued with the past two segments, we talk about hearings, what we spend most of our life preparing for in the case of any proceedings, filing our motions and fi filing our um, various submissions pre and post, but the hearing itself, right, this is a really important, painstaking period of time. Um, and so let's just tease out there, sometimes the ideas that we have about uh, what it means to be a lawyer, what cross-examination is, what the cultural divide is, is from the movies. And so Marcello has teed this up nicely for us. Marcello, what can we learn from the movies, be it A Few Good Men or Django Unchained or any others that our audience may posit into the chat? Marcello, please. Thank you, Rekha. And I just made a kind of joke with, by proposing these themes because since the, the title of this panel is what the books don't teach you. I felt, I felt that it was interesting to see what the movies can teach you regarding the hearings. And uh, I, I, I picked uh, two movies specifically, A Few Good Men uh, with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise, and also Django Unchained with Leonardo DiCaprio and, and, uh, and Christopher Waltz. Uh, but in fact, what these two movies can teach you with respect to the hearings is the following. 
First, you have to know when to stop the cross-examination. You know, there is no possibility uh, that the, the witness will confess something, just like just only this only happens in the Hollywood movies. So you might remember that scene when uh, Tom Cruise in A Few Good Men is cross-examinating Jack Nicholson played, playing uh, Coronel Jessup, whether or not Coronel Jessup has ordered the famous cold red that led to the, to the death of, two, of one private. So at the end, uh, Tom Cruise was pushing very hard Coronel Jessup. And at the end of the scene, Coronel Jessup confessed that he gave order to Private Santiago to be given uh, a code red. So this, I would submit to my fellow colleagues, whether foreigners or Brazilians, that has never happened. In, in, in court cases or in, in arbitration cases. So which means that you are not going to win by knockout. You are going to win by points. So the moment that you make your point is the moment to leave that line of questioning and change whether to, to, to stop the cross-examination with a very nice ending or to move to a different topic, but without giving the, 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 the witness any possibility whatsoever to correct his or her answer. And with respect to Django and Cheney, uh, this is a moment that uh, you have to engage with the arbitral tribunal. As Erica pointed out, build credibility with the arbitral tribunal. And I submit to my colleagues the idea and quoting Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, you might remember that he said once that everyone is entitled to have 15 minutes of fame. I would submit that everyone, every lawyer is entitled to engage with the tribunal within 15 to 25 minutes. If you do not engage with the tribunal, if the tribunal uh, understands that there is nothing intelligent from your part coming from that cross examination, the tribunal will, will not pay attention to your cross. No matter how good you are, no matter how much you have prepared, you have to engage with the tribunal. And the, 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 the scene that I picked from Django and Cheney is the moment of when you have the appearance of Leonardo DiCaprio. There is a scene in which there is a Mandingo fight. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then they approach to buy some fighters. Uh, and in a moment, uh, 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 Christopher Waltz was trying to engage with Leonardo DiCaprio, but DiCaprio uh, who played, I mean, the character was Calvin Candy. So in a moment, Candy was not paying attention to Leonardo to, 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 to Christopher Waltz, uh, the, the, the body hunter. So in a certain moment, he made a proposition to a fighter and, uh, and the DiCaprio uh, says exactly this in his words. First, you got my curiosity. Now you got my attention. So you have to grab the attention of the arbitral tribunal with respect to that. You have to, uh, to lead the message to the tribunal that there is coming something very important for the case to be trialed in favor of your client. Uh, and the tribunal must be uh, patient with you, your line of questioning, because indeed you are going to give a uh, good result for the understanding of the case to the arbitral tribunal. Thank you so much. Please continue to post into the chat any other movies that you think um, demonstrate good or bad techniques that uh, we can um, tease out. Two topics perhaps we can try to get to with our limited time. Um, one, uh, Marcello had posted, but I think it votes for everybody in their input. When is a when is a good or the best time to hear an expert? Any insights? Uh, the, the anecdote that I have in this case, uh, it's uh, I learned from uh, when I was acting as an arbitrator in a case in which the seat was Lisbon, Portugal. And the case involved uh, a Portuguese uh, client against a French constructor. And the panel was uh, chaired by a Colombian uh, arbitrator. Uh, my co-arbitrator was a French guy, and a French professor, and myself as, as, as Brazilian citizen. So I understand that in a certain moment, 
the Portuguese uh, law firm has not uh, disclosed to the witness that one of the members of the panel was a Brazilian. So the, the language of the case was English. So everything was taking place in English, even the deposition of the Portuguese client. And in a certain moment, there was a, there was a, a, a statement from the witness in the opposite sense with the same statement that, that he, has gave, he has given in a pre-arbitral uh, injunction before Portuguese courts. So he was pretending on the pre-injunction phase that the commissioning of the turbine was on, to be taken by care of uh, the, 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 the industry or the, the, the manufacturer. And before the arbitral tribunal record, he was pretending that commission was, has to be made by the client. So there was completely opposite sense. So the, the, the chairman addressed a very straightforward question. I mean, you gave two different versions. Which one is the accurate? And the guy, without knowing that I am a Portuguese speaker, he looked at his lawyer and he said, here I can lie. So I was the only one who grabbed the information. And then, of course, the Portuguese, uh, the, the, the French attorneys were puzzled because they could not understand the Portuguese sentence. Even the Colombian chairman is fluent in Portuguese, but sometimes Portuguese from Portugal is pretty difficult to understand when they speak very quickly. But I, I, I was capable to understand. And needless to say that the French teacher has no clue of, uh, of the sentence. And then I had to approach to everyone's uh, benefit to say in English that uh, he is not allowed to lie nor here or nor, uh, not even in the before courts. But at the end of the day, since he addressed that question to his lawyer, I was fully satisfied with no answer at all because I, I, I really knew the answer would be. So by giving this kind of experience to you guys, uh, I understand that the very first uh, move that you have to do with your client once you have a form uh, a, a arbitral tribunal duly constituted is to address the topics, to address the characteristics and the profiles of the arbitrators in order to avoid this kind of awkward situation that I just described. Anyone else with some insight? I'm curious also about disclosures um, that may have to happen um, during the course of hearings. Christian, though, please. I, I actually wanted to add a follow-up to Marcelo's point about the witnesses. I love the analogy that you're never going to win with a knockout, but just by points. And there's been a few occasions. I, I, my personal style of cross-examination, I'm fairly scripted. I know where I'm going. And occasionally, you have to leave your route. but usually you try to have a fairly good plan. The very few occasions where I've gone off script, it hasn't worked because it's because I think I can get the knockout and I go for the knockout. Uh, not a, a full, did you order a code red kind of knockout, but uh, something close. And Marcelo is absolutely right. It's, it's a very dangerous game, but I wanted to add one exception. And that is that an arbitrator can land the knockout blow. Because of what I've often seen, I'm sure others have as well, when the witness is prepared, they're told, watch out for Marcelo Ferrer, he's a tough interrogator, be on your guard, remember to think, answer slowly, you know, all of the preparation that that witness would have been given. And the moment Marcelo sits down, and then the arbitrator asks the question, the witnesses relax, and then they drop their guard. And that's when the arbitrators come in with some of the best knockout questions you'll ever see. The, the witness is, is, is no longer thinking this is, a, this is a hostile experience. And they then sing like canaries. And I've seen some wonderful examples, some really old school New York arbitrator partners, former partners of large firms uh, who have just been wonderful in their dissection of witnesses. And in two or three steps, will ask a very open-ended question, not a closed-ended question, open. And the witness realizes that it's one thing to play the game with counsel, but it's another with an arbitrator. So you can secure the knockout, but it's rather like the umpire coming in and knocking out the boxer. 
if, if I may just add to what Christian said, which resonates with, with a lot of my own experience, uh, I think it's also important for us as counsel to be very alive as to the tribunal's reaction to the, to the questions and the answers that are uh, put and answered by the witness. And so to, to take up his example, when you see that a tribunal member is particularly interested in a line of questioning, either because of body language, you know, leaning forward on his seat, his or her seat, then sometimes you might want to linger a little longer on that line of questioning because you see you sparked interest. And that often prompts exactly the sort of very powerful, very effective intervention that Christian just mentioned, which is a member of the tribunal stepping in and essentially doing part of your own advocacy for you in a way in which the witness will again feel one, you know, that it's a less hostile environment, and so it might be more forthcoming. But also the, you know, the technique of the arbitrator is not as important. So they get to ask these questions, sometimes open-ended questions, and witnesses will feel pressure to answer. So I think there's a lot of also strategic thinking about how to prompt exactly that sort of intervention that Christian uh, very, very uh, smartly reminded us of. And, and I guess a note here, you know, once you've built your camaraderie with the tribunal, there's also that reality that they won't interrupt you or stop you when you've gone over time if they think you've asked something lucid that they want to hear the answer to. So in a pandemic reality, when we all pivoted big screens, it was often the big screens on your witness and equally as large, if not bigger on that tribunal to know what their reactions were because that's as, as important as you all know, um, as what your witness says or does not say. 1117, mindful we have a question in the chat and I'm gonna pose it to Rose as we close out here. Rose, a question was posed about translation. Who bears the responsibility if the translators either intentionally or unintentionally misrepresent or mistranslate? Does the translator have liability? Um, thank you, Rekha. Um, what I can say with regards to the aspect, with my experience, the the party who's uh, bringing the evidence before the tribunal, they have the cost, and also they have to provide uh, a translator, especially in Europe, it has to be a certified translator. I am not sure, I'm not a translator myself, so I'm not sure um, what kind of insurance they have if they misrepresent any facts. But in my case, when they came before the tribunal, the translator was not translating. The translator was testifying other than what was put on that paper. So there was a big, big difference. That's why I had to go sidebar on the case. So I, I don't have um, a clear answer who would be responsible. But once I told the counsels on the case, what was happening and the translator had to shape. Right, it goes back to cognition, right? During the proceeding, when you see something is wrong, figure out how to introduce it, uh, hopefully to your advantage. With that, I'm gonna finish with our speakers. I had asked them previously one minute, but we do not have that. So in one sentence, if they would, um, quick fire. What is a motto or piece of advice that has done you well in your career? That's really tough, one sentence. It could be a more, an idiom that translates well. <laughs> uh, we'll go, uh, Rose is first on my screen. Rose, please. Don't fall in love with the case. Don't fall in love with the parties, just solve it. Okay, Guy, you're up. I think we're gonna steal from Christian here and just say, walk the line. And I had to, you know, there are some great hearing stories about how doing the right thing pays off in the end. So I'll, I'll stick to that. Christian, please. Um, a piece of life advice I've always had from my father, actually, but it applies in a career. It's easy to be mediocre. <laughs> and Marcello. So I just learned this from a Brazilian poet, uh, Mario Quintana. Life has no draft. Uh, life has no draft. You can't write and then play. Be bold. We will end with be bold. Um, it has been an immense pleasure to share the stage with all of these phenomenal speakers. Our thanks sincerely and collectively go to NYU and to KMCCBC. And we are at 1120, which means we are at the keynote on time to Professor Franco Ferrari. His keynote is entitled, as you see it there, the impact of anti-COVID measures on the substantive law solutions. If you join me in a quick applause to him and we cede the floor. 
So if the best thing to do for me is now to get the applause and stop and go away. So thank you very much, of course, um, for the invitation and uh, for allowing me to be part of this event. It's not the first time I'm allowed to be part of this uh, Brazilian arbitration here at NYU, but thanks for getting back to me again. I will deal with different issues, as you can see from the title. I will deal with some substantive law implications, which all of us who are sitting as arbitrator in cases that uh, have been brought before arbitral tribunals after the pandemic has arisen, have to deal with. Um, I will address issues such as force majeure. I will address issues such as economic hardship under two specific set of instruments. But let me start with my talk. I will refer to a broader context in the beginning and then get into the specifics. Now, we all know, because it's common knowledge, that since the beginning of last year, very strict measures have been implemented by um, the governments in very many jurisdictions to counteract the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Nothing new here. These measures have also affected, of course, international arbitration proceedings, not only as regards, of course, the substantive outcomes of the disputes, which I will be referring to, but also, and this was something um, this morning was said, from an administrative, procedural, and logistical point of view. Suffice it to think how stringent restrictions on movements have affected the possibility of arbitrators, parties, witnesses, and experts to participate in in-person arbitration hearings and proceedings. In this context, the various arbitration institutions have, as was mentioned by Ms. Kermels this morning, actively taken initiatives aimed at preventing the spread of the virus by promoting, as was mentioned, remote work, closing their offices, encouraging the postponement of in-person hearings. Also, many institutions started to reorganize their activities online. The pandemic we are experiencing, however, is in my opinion only a catalyst for this kind of reorganization rather than its trigger. Over the years, there have been a number of what I call pushes towards the use of online dispute resolution tools in the broader sense, which have had certain effects also on arbitral institutions. It appears that the first articles published on the subject date back to 1996 and the first monograph to 2001. In 2002, the American Bar Association published a document that is entitled Addressing Disputes in Electronic Commerce, um, Final Recommendations and Reports. While in 2003, the then Secretary General of um, UNCITRAL noted that with respect to online dispute resolution, UNCITRAL would be um, conducting further research in order to further clarify the debate on how to best address these issues in a global electronic framework. In 2004, Gabriel Kaufmann Kohler and uh, Thomas Schulz, if you may remember, published a book entitled Online Dispute Resolution Challenges for Contemporary Justice, which, as we all know, had a significant impact on both a theoretical and a practical level. In 2010, an UNCITRAL report discussed the possible future work on online dispute resolution. In 2012, the Canadian Department of Justice published the online dispute resolution reference, 
um, it's a guide. And in 2016, the UNCITRAL technical notes on online dispute resolution were adopted. But there are, of course, many, many more important steps and tools that have led to the point where we are today. But it would not be of much use to list them all here today, but they all have one thing in common. They all suggest that the reorganization measures put in place by the various arbitral institutions for reasons of necessity are, and I wanna mention that again, not extemporaneous measures and are not entirely attributable to the pandemic. As pointed out by one scholar, some arbitral institutions had already foreseen the possibility that some procedural steps could be carried out remotely, of course. This seems to confirm the thesis that the current situation in the sense of the current state of online dispute resolution was somehow inevitable. Now, one has to wonder whether this means that there will be no going back and we will have to get used to what one of the speakers this morning called a new normal. However, a piece of news from December 2020, by now a few months away, seems to contradict, contradict the seat. The International Arbitration Center in London at that point announced during or in the middle of the pandemic, that it had created an arbitration hearing room that was safe to use and that was compliant with the most stringent anti-COVID measures. Something they have actually mentioned recently again. This means of course, that the International Arbitration Center at least does not expect the new normal to be a new normal. Now, this, by way of introduction. But despite the relevance of the topic and um, the following remarks will actually not focus on the many measures taken by the various arbitral institutions, some of which were mentioned very early on this morning in order to meet the challenge of the pandemic. Nor will my remarks analyze how arbitrators have attempted to reconcile the need to resolve disputes before them efficiently, despite the reticence of some parties to the use of remote communication tools now available to them, or how the various courts have responded to these attempts. Rather, my remarks will focus on the substantive effects that the measures taken by the various governments in order to contrast the spread of the pandemic are likely to have on the outcome, on the substantive outcome of the dispute. In particular, I will attempt to ascertain whether it is correct to claim, as unfortunately many companies carrying out activities on international markets seem to do today, that these measures constitute an event of force majeure and or cause actually economic hardship, such as to exonerate these companies from liability or allow them to terminate the contract or request that the contract be renegotiated. The answer to this question cannot disregard the identification of course of the applicable law, given the important differences, unfortunately understated by some colleagues, as existing among the various legal systems. And these differences are not diminished by the mere fact that different national laws and transnational instruments, like the one I will be referring to, use the same terms to indicate a given doctrine, such as the term force majeure or hardship. Now, far from focusing on a particular system, today, 
I will address the issues I just mentioned in light of the UNIDRA principles of international commercial contracts, of course, as well as the UN Sales Convention and what we all know as the CSG, which are apparently, apparently the two international instruments most often applied to the merits in international arbitrage. Now, as far as the UNIDRA principles are concerned, the question has to be resolved by taking into account what I think is a very well delineated framework composed of provisions relating to force majeure on the one hand and hardship on the other hand. Now, the existence of these differentiated sets of provisions for the two different issues suggests that these two institutions should be kept distinct, even though they do present some common features. In fact, as stated, for example, in Chevron Corporation um, and Texaco uh, Petrol Corporation v. Ecuador, with express reference to the UNIDRA principles referred to in the award, the institution of force majeure, like that of hardship, is designed to distribute between the parties in a fair and equitable manner the losses and gains resulting from an unforeseeable event. This cannot, however, exempt the interpreter from distinguishing between the two cases in view especially of the quite different consequences that flow from them. And I was basically paraphrasing the award. Indeed, as pointed out by both commentators and the drafters of the UNIDRA principles themselves, there may be factual situations qualifying at the same time as cases of hardship and force majeure. In such cases, it is for the party affected by the event in question to decide what remedy to pursue. If it were to invoke force majeure, it would do so in view of exemption from liability um, for non-performance, of course. If on the other hand, it were to invoke hardship, it would do so primarily with a view to renegotiation of the terms of the contract, so as to enable the contract to be kept alive, albeit, of course, on revised terms. And with regard to force majeure, of course, the relevant provision, we know that is Article 7.1.7, a provision which, according to one commentator, does, however, not present special features. The defaulting party is exempt from liability if it proves that the non-performance was due, and I think we all know it, to an impediment arising from circumstances beyond that party's control, and that it was not reasonably required to foresee such impediment um, at the time, of course, of the conclusion of the contract, or to avoid or overcome the impediment itself or its consequences. Now, as a look at the Unilex database shows, over the years, a number of arbitral tribunals, as well as courts of different jurisdictions, have been tasked with shedding light on the requirements I just referred to, from the concept of impediment to the concept of unforeseeability and that of the impossibility of avoiding or overcoming the impediment or its consequences. Now, for the purposes of my talk today, one Russian decision in particular seems useful to show that some of the measures taken to stem the consequences of the COVID pandemic may indeed constitute an event of force majeure within the meaning of Article 717 of the UNITA principles. Why? The court held that the penalty sought from the defendant was not due sorry, because the late delivery was caused by the fact that the defendant had been subjected to investigations by a government agency. In support of its decision, 
the Russian court referred to Article 717 of the Unified Principles, a provision interpreted by that um, adjudicator as meaning that in order to qualify as force majeure, the impediment must be extraordinary and unavoidable taking into account, of course, the circumstances of the specific case. And now it comes, such as floods, earthquakes, and other similar natural calamities, acts of war, epidemics, etc. Now the government investigation was of course, uh, of course, by the court not considered to be a comparable event to that of an event of force majeure, in that it was neither extraordinary nor inevitable. The reference to epidemics as an event of force majeure, an equation also proposed by commentators who had previously analyzed Article 717 of the Unidrug Principles, is, in my opinion, of particular importance. Because a pandemic such as the one we are experiencing today is nothing more than an epidemic spreading over several countries and several continents. Thus, we should be able to conclude that it cannot be excluded, a priori at least, that pandemics and their consequences, such as the lockdowns, and of course, any other restrictive measures may constitute events of force majeure. This, however, does not mean that one can, as unfortunately some colleagues do, automatically equate the measures taken with force majeure events. That's not possible. But one can state that a priori, there are no obstacles to considering them as such. It will always be necessary to take into account, of course, the circumstance of the specific case and verify, as I will suggest later when I talk about the CISG, whether all the requirements for exemption of liability exist in that specific case. It is necessary just by way of example, to have regard to the type of government measures taken, the time at which these were taken, and in which place in the country of the obligee or of the obligor. The type of application due so that it will be more difficult for the obligor of a monetary obligation than, for example, the obligation to deliver goods to be produced to be exempted from liability. Another element is, of course, the time of the conclusion of the contract, which may affect the foreseeability element required under Article 717 of the UNIDRA principles, and certainly makes exemption more difficult in the event of conclusion of the contract after the outbreak of the pandemic. Concluded, for example, with the mistaken belief that the pandemic would not have lasted as long as it does, or would not have led to the consequences which it did lead to, and so forth. And it is in this context that the discussion about the value of certificates of force majeure issued in different countries, as we have seen, or by different countries, by different countries, or by paragovernmental bodies, as in China, or by chambers of commerce, as in Russia and Italy, for example, becomes right. <laughs> but I do not have the time to dwell on the probative value of these certificates. And thus, whether they are indeed capable of exonerating a party from its liability, as some colleagues suggest. But I have enough time to suggest that they do not. As is known, the UNIDRA principles, and I mentioned it earlier already, govern hardship following a change of circumstances occurring after the conclusion of the contract. Although the starting point of the principles, and this is really important, is that of Pacta Sunt Servanda. Indeed, according to Article 6 to 1 of the principles, where the performance of a contract becomes more onerous for one of the parties, that party is nevertheless bound to perform its obligations, subject, of course, to the following provisions of hardship. That is basically the text of 621. In order, however, to ensure 
that it is not always necessary to sacrifice other principles equally worse of protection, the UNIDRAC principles, as well as the various national laws recognizing the doctrine of hardship or comparable ones, provides that the principle pactus on Servanda is not absolute. Also, it is certainly not of secondary rank. If one considers that the exception to this principle are limited and, in my opinion, must be interpreted for this very same reason restrictively. Now, this relativity of the principle pacta sunt servanda is justified by the desire to accommodate in the most appropriate way the instances of reliance on the continuity of the relationship and the need to safeguard the balance of interest reached and expressed in the contract itself, both of which emerge with particular force in international trade. Now, if a party is able to prove hardship, that party first has the right to request renegotiation of the contract under a given provision, 623 of the principles. If the parties do not reach an agreement on the matter within a reasonable period of time, any one of the parties may, and this irrespective of the reasons for the failure to reach the agreement, ask the court to terminate the contract at a date and terms to be fixed or to adapt, of course, the contract so as to restore its original equilibrium. Now, hardship with the consequence just mentioned occurs in case of occurrence of events which fundamentally alter the equilibrium of the contract, either because of an increase in the cost of performance of one of the parties, of course, or because of a decrease in the value of the counterperformance. And the events occur or become known to the disadvantaged party, of course, after the conclusion of the contract. And the events could not reasonably have been taken into account by the disadvantaged party at the time of the conclusion of the contract. And of course, the events are beyond the control of that disadvantaged party. And the risk of such events had not been assumed by the disadvantaged party in the contract. Now, what does it mean? This means that the COVID-19 pandemic and the measures taken by the various governments may well be considered events altering what I mentioned earlier is a contractual balance, even in a fundamental way, at least with respect to contracts concluded before the occurrence of those events and measures. Also in this context, the moment of the conclusion of the contract is of course relevant as also indicated actually in the recent um, note of the UNIDRA Secretariat on the UNIDRA principles of international commercial contracts and the COVID-19 health crisis. That's the title of this note. Still, other elements must also be taken into account to decide whether hardship does exist. In this context um, as well, a one size fits all answer is inappropriate as in the force majeure context I mentioned earlier. The specifics of the case will be relevant, including the place of performance of the unfulfilled obligation, the location of the contracting party's place of business, as well as the other elements already referred to um, earlier when I refer to force majeure and those which I will refer to later um, when I discuss exemption from liability under um, the CSG. In fact, um, as regards the CSG, let me get to it. It is worth recalling that its system of liability is one of no fault liability. This does not mean that under the CSG, a party at fault can always be called upon to pay damages. That's not what I want to say. The CSG provides grounds for exemption from liability. 
so much so that the strict liability system enshrined fundamentally in the convention has been characterized by commentators as a not absolute, but tempered strict liability system, if I remember correctly. It is in this context that Article 79 is relevant, of which 717 of the unit principle is according to some commentators, merely a rough and bad and incomplete copy because it does not allow the non-performing party to discharge itself from its liability in the event of the non-performance due to force measure of a third party, um, which it has entrusted, of course, with the performance of the contract, which, however, the CSG does allow you to. Pursuant to Article 79 of the CSG, um, I'm recalling or paraphrasing the text, the party is not liable for failure to perform any of its obligations if he proves that the failure was due to an impediment beyond uh, his control and that he could not reason be expected to have taken the impediment into account, again, at the time of the conclusion of the contract, or to have avoided or overcome the event itself or its consequence. So I was just paraphrasing Article 70. In my opinion, this provision allows the defaulting party to exempt itself from liability because of a pandemic such as the one we are living through today, the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, provided that the cumulatively required conditions are met. That is the existence of an impediment beyond the obliger's control, um, which was unforeseeable, insurmountable, and of course, which is causally somehow linked um, to or creates a link between the impediment and the failure to perform. But this requires, as with any other type of impediment, a case-by-case -case analysis. Even if the requirement of the lack of control by the non-performing party over the pandemic and of course, also over the consequences implemented by governments can be, must be considered to always be met. The existence of the other requirements mentioned, however, cannot, in my opinion, be presumed, as however, some colleagues do. With respect to the requirement for civility, for example, again, it must be determined whether, first of all, this requirement refers to the event as such, the pandemic or its scope. In light of the fact that there have been other pandemics in recent decades, the answer to this question becomes, of course, decisive. Obviously, if what matters was the predictability of the scope, or for the seeability of the scope and the consequences of the pandemic, then there would be force in the proposition that they should qualify indeed as unpredictable. unpredictable. As one arbitral tribunal stated in relation to a dispute arising out of course of a different pandemic, the time of the conclusion of the contract is once again also relevant in determining whether there can be exemption from liability, as is also the case, as I mentioned earlier, with Inuda principle. Now, with regard to the unsurmountability of the pandemic and its consequences, what has been said about foreseeability applies in this case, mutatis mutandis. The pandemic as such cannot be avoided, but perhaps some of its consequences can be averted. Let me give you an example. What if the non-compliant party could have easily moved production from a site subject to certain restrictions and lockdowns, for example, to a different site, not subject to these restrictions? What if the circumstances suggest that even in the absence of government measures, the defaulting party would still have defaulted, for example, by performing late. Now, it is clear from what I've just said that once again, a one-size-fits-all answer to determining 
whether a party is exempt from liability is of course not possible. What can be said, however, is that the measures taken following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic cannot be excluded a priori from the type of events that may lead to a party being exempt from liability, where, of course, all the requirements of Article 79 are met. As far as hardship under the CSG is concerned, now it is a hotly debated issue. This is uh, because no reference to hardship can be found in the text of the CSG at all. According to some commentators, the lack of a specific and express rule regarding hardship makes it impossible to rely on this doctrine under the CSG. <laughs> this means that these commentators um, the principal pacta sunt servanda does actually not suffer any exception. Over the years, some courts have espoused this view. Um, there's unfortunately a decision from 1993 by an Italian tribunal that stated, for example, that under the convention, and again, I'm paraphrasing, it should not be possible to invoke the excessive onerousness of the performance as ground for exception from liability. Now, similarly, a Greek decision from 2006 held that the CSG does not entitle the non-performing party to be exonerated from its liability due, uh, due to a change of the economic context existing at the time of the conclusion of the contract. So this, for the practitioners, is incredibly important. According to a different um, set of commentators, economic hardship does actually fall within the scope of Article 79, the first measure provision, so that the party claiming it could be exempt from liability under the same condition, and actually with the same con consequences, as those who claim exemption based on physical and absolute impossibility of performing an obligation under Article 79. So these are the first two um, approaches. According to yet another approach, Economic hardship is a matter indeed governed by the convention, also not expressly in the CSG itself, not even by Article 79. This has consequences. In fact, according to these commentators, economic hardship therefore constitutes one of those matters which, according to the convention itself, actually Article 72, must be settled in conformity with the general principles on which the convention is based. Now, it follows basically that Article 79, even according, even if um, it is not directly applicable according to these colleagues, unlike the approach referred to earlier, is still a source of a general principle applicable to economic hardship. So 79 as an expression of a general principle. This point of view is indeed supported by case law, including that of the Belgium and French Supreme Courts. However, these courts have not limited themselves and have to add, unfortunately, to stating that hardship is, albeit not expressly, somehow settled in the convention. They have also held that the, in the event of hardship, the disadvantaged party is entitled to request the renegotiation of the contract Listen to this under Article 6, 2.3 uh, of the UNIDA principles, because in, according to these two Supreme Courts, um, the UNIDA principles are to be resorted to in order to fill gaps of the convention. Now, this last assumption, allow me to say, also shared by some commentators, has been the object, in my opinion, of criticism that is justified. If hardship were indeed to be governed by a general principle to be inferred from the CSG itself, Article 79, it is hard to see why the consequences it would lead to should, unlike its requirements, be governed by any external source, such as the UNIDRAC principles. Article 79 lays down certain consequences, and these should also apply to hardship, if you at all consider that 79 incorporates, includes a general principle, which is why there cannot, for example, be a right of the disadvantaged party um, 
to ask for a renegotiation of the contract or for the adjudicator, him or herself, to adapt the contract in order to restore an original equilibrium. Now, it should also be noted that to assert that the UNIDRA principles are the source by means of which to fill gaps, internal gaps of the CSG in general, appears to be a non sequitur. It's also pointed out by a judgment of, for example, the Spanish Supreme Court of nearly exactly a year ago, um, July 2020. Now, let me conclude. From what I have said, you clearly get the idea that a priori one cannot exclude that the consequences of the pandemic in the sense of the various lockdowns we have been subject to and the other type of restrictions that we have been subject to cannot be considered force majeure or lead to economic hardship. But suggesting, as some colleagues do, that you can equate these measures with reasons to be exempt from liability or reasons why a party, a non-performing party, should be allowed to ask for renegotiation of the contract or the restoration of an original contractual equilibrium is, in my opinion, incorrect. You have to look at the specifics of the case. You also, in light of what I said in relation to the hardship doctrine under the CSG, you have to also make sure who will be the decision maker and whether the decision maker does adopt one of the various theories um, that are being used to answer the question whether economic hardship is covered by the CSG at all. Thank you very much for your attention.